This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Robert Browning by G. K. Chesterton Section 2 Chapter 1 Browning in Early Life Part 2 it may be well, therefore, to abandon the task of obtaining a clear account of Browning's family, and endeavour to obtain what is much more important, a clear account of his home. For the great central and solid fact which these heraldic speculations tend inevitably to veil and confuse, is that Browning was a thoroughly typical Englishman of the middle class. He may have had alien blood, and that alien blood, by the paradox we have observed, may have made him more characteristically a native. A phase, a fancy, a metaphor may or may not have been born of eastern or southern elements, but he was without any question at all an Englishman of the middle class. Neither all his liberality nor all his learning ever made him anything but an Englishman of the middle class. He expanded his intellectual tolerance until it included the anarchism of Fafine at the fair and the blasphemous theology of Caliban, but he remained himself an Englishman of the middle class. He pictured all the passions of the earth since the fall, from the devouring amorousness of time's revenges to the despotic fantasy of Instan's Tyrannus, but he remained himself an Englishman of the middle class. The moment that he came in contact with anything that was slovenly, anything that was lawless in actual life, something rose up in him, older than any opinions, the blood of generations of good men. He met George Sand and her poetical circle, and hated it, with all the hatred of an old city merchant for an irresponsible life. He met the spiritualists, and hated them, with all the hatred of the middle class for borderlands, and equivocal positions, and playing with fire. His intellect went upon bewildering voyages, but his soul walked in a straight road. He piled up the fantastic towers of his imagination until they eclipsed the planets, but the plan of the foundation on which he built was always the plan of an honest English house in Camberwell. He abandoned with a ceaseless intellectual ambition every one of the convictions of his class, but he carried its prejudices into eternity. It is then of Browning, as a member of the middle class, that we can speak with the greatest historical certainty, and it is his immediate forebears who present the real interest to us. His father, Robert Browning, was a man of great delicacy of taste, and, to all appearance, of an almost exaggerated delicacy of conscience. Every glimpse we have of him suggests that earnest and almost worried kindliness which is the mark of those to whom selfishness, even justifiable selfishness, is really a thing difficult or impossible. In early life Robert Browning Sr. was placed by his father, who was apparently a father of somewhat primitive, not to say barbaric type, in an important commercial position in the West Indies. He threw up the position, however, because it involved him in some recognition of slavery. Whereupon his unique parent, in a transport of rage, not only disinherited him and flung him out of the doors, but by a superb stroke of humour which stands alone in the records of parental ingenuity, sent him in a bill for the cost of his education. About the same time that he was suffering for his moral sensibility, he was also disturbed about religious matters, and he completed his severance from his father by joining a dissenting sect. He was, in short, a very typical example of the serious middle-class man of the Wilberforce period, a man to whom duty was all and all, and who would revolutionize an empire or a continent for the satisfaction of a single moral scruple. Thus, while he was Puritan at the core, not the ruthless Puritan of the seventeenth, but the humanitarian Puritan of the eighteenth century, he had upon the surface all the tastes and graces of a man of culture. Numerous accomplishments of the lighter kind, such as drawing and painting and watercolors, he possessed and his feeling for many kinds of literature was fastidious and exact. But the whole was absolutely redolent of the polite severity of the eighteenth century, 
he lamented his son's early admiration for byron and never ceased adjuring him to model himself upon pope he was in short one of the old-fashioned humanitarians of the eighteenth century a class which we may or may not have conquered in moral theory but which we most certainly have not conquered in moral practice robert browning senior destroyed all his fortunes in order to protest against black slavery white slavery may be as later economists tell us a thing infinitely worse but not many men destroy their fortunes in order to protest against it the ideals of the men of that period appear to us very unattractive to them duty was a kind of chilly sentiment but when we think what they did with those cold ideals we can scarcely feel so superior they uprooted the enormous upas of slavery the tree that was literally as old as the race of man they altered the whole face of europe with their deductive fancies we have ideals that are really better ideals ideals of passion of mysticism of a sense of the youth and adventurousness of the earth but it will be well for us if we achieve as much by our frenzy as they did by their delicacies it scarcely seems as if we were as robust in our very robustness as they were robust in their sensibility robert browning's mother was the daughter of william wiederman a german merchant settled in dundee and married to a scotch wife one of the poet's principal biographers has suggested that from this union of the german and scotch browning got his metaphysical tendency it is possible but here again we must beware of the great biographical danger of making mountains out of molehills what browning's mother unquestionably did give to him was in the way of training a very strong religious habit and a great belief in manners thomas carlyle called her the type of a scottish gentlewoman and the phrase has a very real significance to those who realize the peculiar condition of scotland one of the very few european countries where large sections of the aristocracy are puritans thus a scottish gentlewoman combines two descriptions of dignity at the same time little more is known of this lady except the fact that after her death browning could not bear to look at places where she had walked browning's education in the formal sense reduces itself to a minimum in very early boyhood he attended a species of dame school which according to some of his biographers he had apparently to leave because he was too clever to be tolerable however this may be he undoubtedly went afterwards to a school kept by mr reddy at which again he was marked chiefly by precocity but the boy's education did not in truth take place at any systematic seat of education it took place in his own home where one of the quaintest and most learned and most absurdly indulgent of fathers poured out in an endless stream fantastic recitals from the greek epics and medieval chronicles if we test the matter by the test of actual schools and universities browning will appear to be almost the least educated man in english literary history but if we test it by the amount actually learned we shall think that he was perhaps the most educated man that ever lived that he was in fact if anything over educated in a spirited poem he has himself described how when he was a small child his father used to pile up chairs in the drawing-room and call them the city of troy browning came out of the home crammed with all kinds of knowledge knowledge about the greek poets knowledge about the provincial troubadours knowledge about the jewish rabbis of the middle ages but along with all this knowledge he carried one definite and important piece of ignorance an ignorance of the degree to which such knowledge was exceptional he was no spoiled and self-conscious child taught to regard himself as clever in the atmosphere in which he lived learning was a pleasure and a natural pleasure like a sport or wine he had in it the pleasure of some old scholar of the renaissance when grammar itself was as fresh as the flowers of spring he had no reason to suppose that every one did not join in so admirable a game his sagacious destiny while giving him knowledge of everything else left him in ignorance of the ignorance of the world of his boyish days scarcely any important trace remains except a kind of diary which contains under one date the laconic statement married two wives this morning the insane ingenuity of the biographer 
would be quite capable of seeing in this a most suggestive foreshadowing of the sexual dualism which is so ably defended in Fafine at the Fair. A great part of his childhood was passed in the society of his only sister, Sariana, and it is a curious and touching fact that with her also he passed his last days. From his earliest babyhood he seems to have lived in a more or less stimulating mental atmosphere, but as he emerged into youth he came under great poetic influences which made his father's classical poetic tradition look for the time insipid. Browning began to live in the life of his own age. As a young man he attended classes at University College. Beyond this there is little evidence that he was much in touch with intellectual circles outside that of his own family. But the forces that were moving the literary world had long passed beyond the merely literary area. Upon the time of Browning's boyhood a very subtle and profound change was beginning in the intellectual atmosphere of such homes as that of the Brownings. In studying the careers of great men, we tend constantly to forget that their youth was generally passed and their characters practically formed in a period long previous to their appearance in history. We think of Milton, the Restoration Puritan, and forget that he grew up in the living shadow of Shakespeare and the full summer of the Elizabethan drama. We realize Garibaldi as a sudden and almost miraculous figure rising about fifty years ago to create the new kingdom of Italy and we forget that he must have formed his first ideas of liberty while hearing at his father's dinner-table that Napoleon was the master of Europe. Similarly, we think of Browning as the great Victorian poet, who lived long enough to have opinions on Mr. Gladstone's Home Rule Bill, and forget that as a young man he passed a bookstall and saw a volume ticketed Mr. Shelley's aesthetic poem, and had to search even in his own really cultivated circle for someone who could tell him who Mr. Shelley was. Browning was, in short, born in the afterglow of the greatest revolution. The French Revolution was at root a thoroughly optimistic thing. It may seem strange to attribute optimism to anything so destructive, but in truth this particular kind of optimism is inevitably and by its nature destructive. The great dormant idea of the whole of that period the period before, during, and long after the revolution, is the idea that man would, by his nature, live in an Eden of dignity, liberty, and love, and that artificial and decrepit systems are keeping him out of that Eden. No one can do the least justice to the great Jacobeans who does not realize that to them breaking the civilization of ages was like breaking the cords of a treasure chest. And just as for more than a century great men had dreamed of this bountiful emancipation, so the dream began, in the time of Keats and Shelley, to creep down among the dullest professions and the most prosaic classes of society. A spirit of revolt was growing among the young of the middle classes, which had nothing at all in common with the complete and pessimistic revolt against all things in heaven or earth, which has been fashionable among the young in more recent times. The Shelleyan enthusiast was altogether on the side of existence. He thought that every cloud and clump of grass shared his strict republican orthodoxy. He represented, in short, a revolt of the normal against the abnormal. He found himself, so to speak, in the heart of a holy, topsy-turvy, and blasphemous state of things, in which God was rebelling against Satan. There began to arise about this time a race of young men like Keats, members of a not highly cultivated middle class, and even of classes lower, who felt in a hundred ways this obscure alliance with eternal things against temporal and practical ones, and who lived on its imaginative delight. They were a kind of furtive universalist. They had discovered the whole cosmos, and they kept the whole cosmos a secret. They climbed up dark stairs to meagre garrets and shut themselves in with the gods, Numbers of the great men who afterwards illuminated the Victorian era were at this time living in mean streets in magnificent daydreams. Ruskin was solemnly visiting his solemn suburban aunts. Dickens was going to and fro in a blacking factory. Carlyle, slightly older, was still lingering on a poor farm in Doomfreshire. Keats had not long become the assistant of the country surgeon when Browning was a boy in Camberwell.
on all sides there was the first beginnings of the aesthetic stir in the middle classes which expressed itself in the combination of so many poetic lives with so many prosaic livelihoods it was the age of inspired office boys browning grew up then with the growing fame of shelley and keats in the atmosphere of literary youth fierce and beautiful among new poets who believed in a new world it is important to remember this because the real browning was a quite different person from the grim moralist and metaphysician who is seen through the spectacles of browning societies and university extension lectures browning was first and foremost a poet a man made to enjoy all things visible and invisible a priest of the higher passions the misunderstanding that has supposed him to be other than poetical because his form was often fanciful and abrupt is really different from the misunderstanding which attaches to most other poets the opponents of victor hugo called him a mere windbag the opponents of shakespeare called him a buffoon but the admirers of hugo and shakespeare at least knew better now the admirers and opponents of browning alike make him out to be a pedant rather than a poet the only difference between the browning knight and the anti browning knight is that the second says he was not a poet but a mere philosopher and the first says that he was a philosopher and not a mere poet the admirer disparages poetry in order to exalt browning the opponent exalts poetry in order to disparage browning and all the time browning himself exalted poetry above all earthly things served it with single-hearted intensity and stands among the few poets who hardly wrote a line of anything else. End of section two.